If a dog or cat is suspected to have a spinal cord problem, then many vets will recommend getting spinal x-rays as the first step in the diagnostic um, investigation. However, getting a good spinal radiograph is a lot more challenging than people think. And I get sent an awful lot of non-diagnostic images, which were a complete waste of the animal having an anaesthetic and a waste of money for the client. So in this video, I'm going to impart my tips for getting the best imaging that you can. First of all, you need the right equipment. And if your practice doesn't have these radiolucent uh, wedges, then I strongly recommend that you purchase them, especially these triangular wedges here. These are the most useful for positioning the spine. Next, you need to position the animal. And for that, I recommend that you have ties. Um, these allow you to very gently draw the limbs away from the spine or position the animal straight or in extension. Um, because the spine must be imaged uh, with it in extension and not in flexion. Next, sandbags are invaluable for making sure that the animal is positioned in a um, straight in a, um, when you're doing a ventral dorsal radiograph or um, for helping to support uh, limbs in position. What are you trying to do? We well, are trying to position the animal so that the vertebrae are in line with each other and are not rotated. Uh, and that reasoning for that is obvious because in uh, the investigation of intervertebral disc space disease, you're often looking for a narrowing of that intervertebral disc space. But if you've positioned the animal poorly and the disc spaces are collapsed because uh, you haven't um, supported, for example, the neck, then those disc spaces are going to look narrow because they've just uh, collapsed in on themselves, not because there's actually any pathology. And so if you really want to make uh, an image that is interpretable, then you need to have the animal positioned correctly in the first place so that you can see if any of those disc spaces are narrowed um, or changed. So um, if we take our dog, for example, Obviously, we need to optimise the collimation and the exposure. And I'm not going to talk about those because that's actually the easy part, measuring the animal um, and uh, taking the right bit of anatomy. The bit that people uh, often neglect to do is to position the spine in extension to open up those disc spaces so that true narrowing can be appreciated. And for that, you need to stretch the animal um, uh, not overstretch the animal, but you need to position the spine in extension. So, for example, this uh, um, is a, a radiograph, um, which you might say, oh, yeah, that's a that's a spinal radiograph. I can I can see it, um, see all the spine there. But this is not um, a, a spine in extension. And so it is much more difficult to interpret. So this animal needed to be uh, positioned in extension more. And to do that will require anesthesia or heavy sedation. You cannot expect an animal to lie with its uh, spine optimally positioned if you just weight the animal with sandbags. They are going to put their back into flexion. And so there's no getting around this. You need to be able to the animal needs to be relaxed enough that you are able to position the animal. The um, neck will be rotated if the head is not parallel to the table. And by that, I mean the jaw being parallel to the table. So if the animal is just resting on its head, because this bit is the round bit of the head, they'll naturally um, rotate down so that their nose is lying on the, on, the, on the table. And this will rotate the neck. So you need to put something underneath the jaw so as the head remains completely parallel to the table. Next, you need to put wedges under the bits that sag. You can't expect, especially in a long neck dog, that this neck will re remain straight on the table, especially if this head is very rounded and obviously there's a big chest. This bit will naturally sag. And so you can't get good imaging of the neck unless you put something under that neck. And of course, it needs to be radiolucent because otherwise, how can you take an imaging of that neck? These scapula are right in the way of the spine, especially the caudal part of the spine. So if you want to take a cervical radiograph, 
and assess the C6, C7 disk space, which is one of the most common disk spaces to have a problem, then you need to draw the scapula back. Likewise, if you want to assess the thoracic spine, then you need to draw the, the scapula forwards. Um, the spine will be rotated if the thorax is not positioned parallel. But of course, the dogs are often very barrel chested, so they will roll. Um, so you need to have something under this part of the thorax, usually, um, uh, uh, so that the thorax is, uh, is positioned parallel. Sometimes you need to put something under this edge if the dog is very barrel chested and the ribs are in the way of the spine. So what do I mean by this? So this is um, uh, images of a dog positioned for a, a lateral cervical radiograph. Um, and um, I've put a, an image here of where we're aiming for the collimation. One of the things I've observed is that uh, when people are taking radiographs, they think the spine is up here, but actually it's very much in the, in the center of the neck. And I use the point of the shoulder and the wing of the atlas in which to collimate my beam. So you can see in this dog that the forelimbs have been pulled back gently so that the scapula are not obscuring that caudal cervical region. Um, so I've put some light ties over this dog um, and they're just actually hooked over a, a, a hook at the end of, of the table. You can see that I have that radiolucent wedge. Our wedges are, are covered so that we can clean them more easily than the foam ones that I sh um, showed you. And you can see also that I have this um, uh, uh, radiolucent wedge that is underneath the chin so that this part of the, the neck is uh, is is um, is straight. And you can see that um, this is my line of collimation, as I've said before. Here's another example. Um, so uh, it's quite common for um, Dobermans to get neck disease. And although in many instances we would choose to uh, obtain CT or MRI these days, there still may be some call for taking preliminary radiographs uh, in a primary practice, or perhaps you don't have uh, the availability of further diagnostic imaging. Um, so again, you can see that the limbs have been pulled back because we definitely want to get to that C6, C7 region in this breed because that is the most common uh, one that is diseased. And that is in about that area there. Um, we want to make sure that the neck is supported that's that triangular wedge going under there because this is a very floppy necked breed. And we definitely want to make sure that we have that triangular wedge going underneath the jaw there. And you can see that this animal is anaesthetized. We need to get the VD as well. Um, and so um, we with this, especially with this long neck, it's very important that we, we get this bit here completely uh, straight. So we may need a tie. Um, this is very loosely placed. It's really just used as a guide to help just get that neck um, and, and chin completely straight. Um, and then we have um, the forelimbs drawn back. So again, this is very gently drawn back and these sandbags are used just to help keep those in position there and then sandbags either side of the dog. You may be wondering why I'm not using a trough. I actually find that a trough uh, makes things much more difficult. I have to pull the dog out of the trough to be able to get that um, C6, C7 region, which is here a lot further back than sometimes people think. And we need to include that uh, particular imaging. Um, and so I find that that using a trough just um, is a lot more difficult. I can achieve just as good results, better results with sandbags. Um, so I need to position to line up the, the sternum and the larynx and the point of the chin to make sure this is completely straight. And next, when you're doing your collimation, just bear in mind that in a deep chested dog, the distance here, especially when you take into account that you need to put a wedge under the neck to stop it sagging, um, the distance here is a lot greater than the distance here. And it's very unlikely in a deep chested dog that you're going to get an exposure that is perfect for here and perfect for here. So make two images, one optimizing the exposure for here 
and one optimizing the exposure for the caudal cervical region. And don't forget to put something under that neck to make sure that it's not sagging down. Otherwise, it will be these vertebrae which are um, uh, artificially close together. So here's an example of a poor radiograph. Um, uh, you know, this was this was the only radiograph done. This is what um, uh, the owners had to pay for. Um, and we can see that it's rotated um, so that you can see the jaw is definitely not in line. And we can see the um, arterial foramen of, of, of the atlas here, which we would never normally see at the top of the spine. So this is completely rotated. This is uh, more or less straight, but we can't evaluate this area because the scapula and the shoulder joint is right over that um, uh, uh, C4 to C3 region. So all of these discs uh, we can't see. Uh, is this disc narrow? We don't know. There's unlikely to be anything underneath this neck supporting uh, that uh, region. And even this scapula is, uh, uh, is, is over this first part of the neck as well. And uh, I point out this as well as this, uh, this animal has collapsed lungs because this endotracheal tube has been pushed down so far it's obscuring the bronchus. So not a good radiograph. Um, what does a good radiograph look like? Uh, so we can see uh, here, we can see all of the disc spaces nice and, and clearly. This is an immature animal, so you can see the growth plates. Um, and uh, we can see that the bulla are completely superimposed. So um, uh, are almost completely superimposed. So we can tell that this neck, this head is straight. Um, we can see that the uh, transverse wings of the atlas are superimposed and uh, further down that we can see that the transverse processes of the C6 are superimposed. So we know that this neck is completely straight and if this is a very brachycephalic dog um, and we, so we know that it's sitting on a very rounded head so this will need support underneath the, the neck to achieve that and whilst when we do that we can see that this space is opened up here and that this animal has a possible atlantoaxial instability. So how do we position for lower down the spine? Well, uh, this is an example of how we need to get that spine in extension. And this is why you have to have uh, anesthesia or heavy sedation to get that spine in, this, in, in extension and uh, open up those disc spaces to their natural extent. And so we need to have the forelimbs drawn forward gently. We're not stretching the animal like it's on a rack and the pelvic limbs back. Uh, the uh, next thing is that we need to put a wedge uh, uh, between the pelvic limbs so that the pelvis is straight. So uh, here's another example, that sort of semicircular wedge is pretty useful for that. Um, and then we need a wedge put under the thorax so that we, instead of the animal rolled down onto the table in this direction, we can tip it back so that spine is straight. Um, and uh, and then I will also support the head by a foam wedge because although I'm not imaging the neck in this image, the, the neck is obviously connected to the thorax. I don't want any uh, reason for the spine being twisted. Uh, when How do we position the ventral dorsal spine? Well, very similar to the... Um, the, the cervical imaging that I was uh, showing you, but obviously we're going to want to, to make sure that the chest down to the pelvis is uh, straight. Um, so I try to get the arms out the way, sorry, the arms, the uh, forelimbs out of the way. Um, and uh, these limbs aren't actually tied. They're just the, the um, they just have the ties on it from the previous imaging. I just have some sandbags over there and then some other sandbags next to support. Um, we have the wedging underneath the neck to make sure that this isn't flopping down and pulling on the um, on the th thorax. So I extend those uh, pelvic limbs gently using using ties um, and um, and then use these uh, sandbags, which works, in my opinion, much, much better than a trough. And then I don't have to lift dogs in and out of a trough as uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, and uh, the you can use the ties to sort of draw the uh, limbs gently towards the t the tail if necessary, especially if you're taking a cervical image. So, 
what sort of other tips do I have? Um, one of them is that if you are looking at the atlantoaxial area or the craniosurvical area, um, although you will definitely need anesthesia to do this safely, unfortunately, the endotracheal tube will interfere with your view of the dens. And so you may need to briefly and very carefully remove the endotracheal tube to visualise the VD spines. The way I do it is that I position the animal exactly how I like um, and then very quickly whip the tube out, take the image, and then, um, and, and then I will put the tube very gently back in. Very gently back in, of course, because if I'm expecting there to be a lantoaxial problem, then um, I uh, do not want to be manipulating that spine too much. And on that, if you do suspect that there is an atlantoaxial problem, then you may need to do some dynamic imaging. Um, for example, this is an extension and a flexion image. And for this, all the positioning is exactly the same, except in the flexion. I just take a sandbag and move the, um, the uh, head down into that flexion position very briefly. And this is the sandbag you can just see picked up by the, the um, radiograph here. And then take the image again very quickly. Um, you may need to use an armoured tube um, if you have one for those. Um, it, just to protect the airway. Most people don't, however. Um, so you need to do that quite quickly so as not to obs uh, obstruct the endotracheal endo tube. And you can see in this animal, in this perfectly, um, uh, very nicely positioned extended image, we can't see any atlantoaxial instability, although we may have suspected it um, based on the very um, uh, small dens in the last image, uh, which I'm going to go back to. Um, and but you see when we do the flexion that this whole space uh, is opening up. There's a dens there. You can see that it is coming away from the atlas and, and has quite a lot of dorsal elevation uh, into the spinal canal, suggesting that the transverse ligament of the dens has been disrupted. And in this image here, what I forgot to point out is this is a hypoplastic dens. So this is a very, very small dens. It would be normally much bigger than that. So I hope that this, these tips have helped you when you're taking spinal radiographs in the future. Thank you very much.